little bit about me after I tell you uh, some about um, the distinguished group of panelists we have here today. Um, but before I, I introduce everyone, let me just try to frame this discussion about, uh, about future energy. Um, we are obviously sitting here today in one of the world's most energy-rich countries. Uh, Kazakhstan is one of the world's top 20 energy producers, uh, excuse me, top 20 oil producers. It's one of the world's top 10 coal producers, and it is by far the world's top uranium producer. Now Kazakhstan is talking about embarking on a very different sort of energy push, a push into renewable sources of energy, particularly wind and solar and geothermal, and importantly, in in the view of the Kazakh government, a push into energy efficiency, which is to say, figuring out how to waste less of the energy that uh, Kazakhstan and the world produces regardless of the source. Um, now, even the leaders of Kazakhstan are not suggesting that uh, Kazakhstan or the world is going to shift off of fossil fuels anytime soon, uh, and we'll talk about that. Um, it's clearly going to be years, even decades, before uh, uh, any kind of significant shift happens, uh, even, I think, under the most rosy expectations of the uh, Kazakh government. Uh, However, uh, what's being discussed here is a hugely uh, difficult uh, undertaking. Uh, it's an undertaking uh, that not just Kazakhstan, but uh, uh, many of the countries around the world are embarking uh, on. It's, a, it's an undertaking that has sparked a race uh, among countries uh, to corner what they regard as a new market in clean energy technologies. Uh, and it's a race, and we're going to talk about this here, that's produced very nasty uh, geopolitical uh, fights uh, among countries uh, and very nasty uh, domestic uh, political battles uh, within uh, countries. Uh, and the question uh, is a very basic uh, question. Uh, the question is not so much whether the planet benefits, whether the environment benefits. The question really is who wins and who loses economically in this shift. And that's what I want us to drill down into today. It's a, it's a messy and an extraordinarily controversial question. And I want us to explore that messiness and that controversy in some detail. Let me first introduce uh, our panelists, and then and then we'll, we'll jump into this. I'm gonna I was gonna do this in alphabetical order, but we're gonna just do it in the order of, of people sitting here. Um, first, we have Nurlan Magal, uh, who since last year has been uh, CEO of the Kazakhstan Association of Oil and Gas uh, and, and uh, the Energy Sector Organization, Kaz Energy. Um, previously, he was a vice minister of energy and mineral resources, later a vice minister of oil and gas, and has a long uh, career having worked in the oil and gas industry in Kazakhstan. Um, next to Mr. Magalv, we have uh, Minister Nurlan uh, Kaparov, who is, uh, as all of you know, Kazakhstan's Minister of Environmental Protection, uh, a Harvard MBA, um, an oil executive in Kazakhstan for many years, and previously Deputy Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources. Um, next to Minister Kaparov, uh, we have Siddharth Saxena from uh, Cambridge, who, as I gather, is no stranger to this forum and to many of you in this room. Um, Siddharth is based at Cambridge University as chairperson of the Cambridge Central Asia Forum and director of Cambridge's Kazakhstan Center, a frequent visitor to Kazakhstan and teacher about this country and this region of the world to his students. Um, next to Siddharth is Ariel Cohen from the Heritage Foundation in Washington. Um, Ariel is a senior research fellow for Russian and Eurasian studies in international energy policy at the Heritage Foundation, which is a um, quite prominent think tank in the United States. Um, Ariel frequently testifies before the U.S. Congress uh, on Russian and Eurasian politics and law and economics, and frequently uh, he's a prolific writer and commentator to the press on these issues. Um, and I, I gather uh, no, uh, has very little fear of talking Turkey, as we say in the United States, so we'll see that today. Uh, huh? Talking Kazakhstan. Talking Kazakhstan. And um, uh, to uh, Ariel's left is Matthew Sagers um, from uh, IHS Sira, which is based in the United States. Um, Matthew sits in Washington as well. IHS Sira is a quite prominent uh, energy analysis and consulting firm based in the United States, but with offices around the world. Um, Matthew specializes in energy and transportation systems and energy development throughout the former Soviet Union. Um, his interests particularly are with Russian oil and gas production, Russian uh, oil and gas refining, or Russian oil refining and, um, and consumption patterns. Um, and he, like uh, Ariel, also uh, 
talks about these issues before global audiences, so he will presumably not be shy about expressing his opinions today. As for me, my name is Jeff Ball. I am basically a curious guy who likes to ask impolite questions when people don't want to answer them. I spent most of my life as a journalist. I was for 14 and a half or so years at the Wall Street Journal in the United States as an energy reporter and environment editor. Um, and about a year and a half ago, moved to Stanford University in California, where I'm at a think tank dealing with uh, energy finance and policy. So let's just start. What I thought I would do, just to start, and then I will stop talking, and we will get to the uh, to the meat of the matter, is I want I want all of us to be on the same page about where the world is today in terms of energy, and when we talk about the term future energy, what at least conventional wisdom is that that might mean. So these statistics are not mine; they're taken from the International. National Energy Agency, yeah, which is essentially conventional wisdom uh, uh, on global energy uh, supply. Uh, and this is from a report that came out late last year, and this is all energy demand, uh, or, or, or uh, essentially energy, energy supply as well in the world, um, not just electricity, not just transportation, but everything. And what you see very quickly, you see obviously that fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas are the overwhelming sources of energy. Um, uh, you see hydro, nuclear, bioenergy uh, are all smaller bits. And um, for the purposes of this conversation, I want to... Oh, sorry, it fell. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. For the... For the purposes of this conversation, I want us to pay particular attention to the slice that says other renewables, wind and solar. Other renewables are about 1%. Um, that is not to say that they are not important at all, um, because this is a very, very large pie in economic terms, and the pie is growing. But I want us to keep perspective about what's dominating now. And so that's today. And can we just switch the slide to the, ne to, to the next one, which is the last one? Can someone switch the slide, please? So that's future. So this is the IA prediction of what the world energy supply might look like essentially 20 years down the road. And what do you see? You see a few things are the same. Some very important things are the same. Coal, oil, and natural gas still predominate. Um, nuclear is essentially flat. Bioenergy is essentially flat. Other renewables, again, uh, wind and solar and a few other things, geothermal, um, are, it depends how you want to look at this question. They are uh, for, uh, they're 4% rather than 1% today, which is quite a large increase, but they're still 4% of 100%, which is there that means that they are almost still the smallest slice of the pie. The one last thing I'll say is that this pie in 2035 is much bigger than the pie in 2010 because the world's energy demand is increasing rapidly. So I'm going to stop with the lecture here. I just wanted everyone to be on the same page about what the expectations are. So um, let's Let's jump in here, and I guess the first thing I want to ask is, um, I want us to define terms here. Um, when, when people talk about future energy, what, how do you construe future energy, and, and, and even more basically, What's wrong, if anything, with today's energy system? What's the reason to change? Um, and uh, Minister Kaparov, why don't we start with you? Uh, I think the. Do you hear me? Yeah. I, I, can, can, maybe. It, can, can you hear him? I think that we. Um, we um, when we talk about future energy, of course, we, we don't talk only about renewables. We talk about all sources of energy. And, uh, but we see that uh, uh, the uh, share of renewables uh, is, uh, will be increasing, as you, you can see it from this slide as well. Let me just, can everyone hear or no? Is there anyone who cannot hear? OK, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thanks. So basically, uh, um, Future energy uh, uh, is not about only uh, uh, hydrocarbons. It's about, uh, uh, it's about uh, not only about the nuclear, but uh, the, uh, the introduction of renewables no, and increasing uh, share of renewables uh, is a big trend. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, of course, what we will be uh, uh, emphasizing in the theme of future energy in Kazakhstan, especially in the context of uh, Expo 2017, uh, of course, will be 
talking more about Конечно, renewables as a new source of energy here in the, in the region. Uh, although, we, of course, we will be also talking about uh, traditional sources of energy, like, uh, like uh, oil, uh, gas, and uh, uh, coal. So when, when you talk about future energy, you're talking about a more diversified energy system, diversified in the sense that renewables are a bigger portion of the mix. Yeah. Hydrocarbons uh, uh, will not last long. Say we, uh, some predictions say that uh, worldwide we have hydrocarbons, uh, if you don't talk about coal, but oil and, gas, uh, uh, oil and gas reserves are available for another 50 to 70 years. Kazakhstan's reserves. Kazakhstan's as well. Kazakhstan probably even less. We и другие ресурсы. Возможно, в Казахстане нефть и газ будут даже меньше длиться, может быть, 40 лет только. Worldwide hydrocarbons will, except coal, will start to diminish eventually because the and of course the replacement should be done by something and I think that the numbers which we saw today, 4% of renewables is a small number. I think my personal prediction will be that the share of renewables will be dramatically increasing. What's the number? I don't know. Nobody knows. It depends on the development of technologies, of course. But by by uh, uh, predictions of some, uh, uh, some uh, specialists from, from uh, Silicon Valley, they say that uh, solar, solar capex cost in 2017 already will be below, below uh, new coal production, new, new coal facilities. So after 2020, it will be dramatic uh, decrease of uh, cost, capex cost on so, the so, 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 so nobody knows how, how fast it will grow, but I'm sure it will grow very fast. The, the Kazakh government indeed has articulated a vision of 50% of the energy mix being renewable energy by 2050. Am I right about that? Yes, that's our president's vision, which he declared in the uh, strategy 2050, uh, that Kazakhstan should have uh, 50% share of alternative and renewable sources by 2050. How do we identify what does it mean? Uh, what does it mean renewable and alternative? We include nuclear as well. Okay. So in Kazakhstan, nuclear is alternative for our traditional sources. Uh, so therefore, uh, we see that up to uh, about 7-8% uh, of of nuclear uh, portion will be in 2050. The rest, 42% or 43, will be solar, wind, and uh, uh, biomass. Wow. Okay, I'm going to stop you there. Thank you. That's, that's, so I want, who wants to jump in here? Is 42% wind, solar, biomass for Kazakhstan in 2050 and the trajectory that one would need to follow to get there, 7 or 8% nuclear, 42% renewable? Is that realistic? I'm smiling because I do not want to follow the well, you're not following the minister. Um, I think Kazakhstan is in, is in a unique position because it's a country that suffered environmental degradation like no other country. The RLC catastrophe where the RLC dried, the Russian, uh, Soviet uh, nuclear tests in Simpalatinsky, uh, all taught Kazakhstan a lesson about serving the environment. It's important. On the other hand, Kazakhstan, as we discussed before the panel, uh, is uh, blessed by uh, oil, gas, coal, uh, and uranium. And while the market is good, while the prices are high, it probably is a good idea to maximize the uh, revenue, whatever the internal mix is. Now, the leaders uh, of transitioning to green uh, are the pioneers. And the pioneers in whatever area uh, always get, you know, blows. Uh, so, uh, the price that Germany is paying 
for its high percentage of wind. Well, Spain is paying for its high percentage of solar. When you look at it, you realize that only very rich countries with high total GDP and high per capita GDP today, and I stress today because as the Minister said, the technology is evolving, the PV photovoltaic kilowatt price is going down, and we hope that this trajectory continues, PV is going to be eventually competitive, I hope so. But today, in order to develop real renewables, wind and sun, you have to establish high feed tariffs. Will the minister define it for us, please? I'll, I'll define it quickly. So here, here's the situation around the world. Renewable energy technologies where they've been introduced have needed to be subsidized because the initial capital expense of deploying these new technologies is higher than traditional sources of energy. And so there are a number of different ways governments have gone about this. And one way is something called a feed-in tariff, which has been used in Europe, which essentially pays producers of renewable energy a guaranteed price to sell into the system that is higher than the price we defend our new amendments to uh, renewables law in the parliament. Uh, uh, and next week we have the second uh, hearing in the parliament for the feed-in tariff on the imposition of a feed-in tariff in Kazakhstan. So I hope that uh, by uh, 3rd July we'll have already law in place. Okay, so let me just stop and I want to bring everyone else in, but I, I'm going I'm to take a bit of a, of, of a leap here and suggest that what we have here is the makings of a slightly different view of the world. Um, we, what we've heard the minister articulate is that is a, is a ramp up to 50% renewable energy by 2050. And what we've heard Ariel Cohn say is that um, perhaps in the future this might happen, but he would argue that countries like Kazakhstan need to be very careful about making sure that they maximize revenue from fossil fuels today, that the shift not be uh, too dislocated. And I would add the second point is that you, you go into this, it's essentially a major economic transaction. It's a multi-year policy shift that you can put a price for. So when you do something like that, when you buy a car, when you buy a house, when you shift your energy paradigm, you want to know what you're going to pay. So you can calculate how much is, is it going to cost and then make a decision and have a broad discussion in the society how, how much and who will pay and do you want to do it or not. And if everybody agrees, like in Germany, there is almost wall to wall agreement that they want to do it, and they're willing to pay and it costs 7 billion uh, euro a year, and it's fine, it's fine with that. So, well, it's actually not necessarily fine, there's quite a debate in Germany now about the future of this, but we'll get into that in a second. Let me, so I want to just bring in Siddharth, why don't you jump in, I see you nodding your head. Um, you're in the middle here, so are you in the middle philosophically? Or? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm floating middle in, in the middle. But being from a technical perspective, uh, uh, which is where I come from, there, there are a few interesting things. Aspects. First is that when we talk about uh, green energy and renewables, uh, there is, uh, like in uh, any discourse, there's a red herring, but here we have a green herring. Uh, the green herring being that renewable uh, technologies uh, and renewable infrastructure are made up of things случае, which may or may not be renewable themselves, i.e. if you're making solar cells, you're relying heavily Если, on silicon, iron. Uh, the cost of those, production of those, can often be um, as less green 
than the, the, the energy that you're trying to produce from. Right? So, uh, and the, the other green herring is the pie charts that you put up there, yeah. which, are, which of course are uh, culturally important to show what the division of things are. However, it Потому fails to address the deeper point, which is the interrelationship between Нужно those different sectors. Many of those things do not exist in vacuum of each other. They develop Ведь one with another, one from another. Uh, and I think this is where uh, uh, we need to think quite holistically about production, storage, and transmission of energy. And how do you make that, that whole supply chain, the whole process green, is, is what we really need to think about very carefully. So just to be clear, yes. you're suggesting that, that making, making an energy system more environmentally sustainable is not simply about solar panels and wind turbines. It's about thinking systemically about how you make even a system that is overwhelmingly fossil fuel based, right, less wasteful, more efficient, exactly. therefore more environmental, less environmentally possible. Okay. And also Redeploying the, the potential within that, uh, and I, I often say, and I said it in uh, another meeting this morning, that how you can convert the oil and gas to petrochemical downstream products like plastics and polymers, combining with Kazakhstan's other big wealth, rare earth metals and metals and uh, mining products, to, to form new technologies where we actually start to look at a level below how to, to, to make these technologies scalable. Uh, scalable both sustainability in, in a sustainability sense, but also in the pricing sense, how getting them to household them. And that is where I think, again, the Kazakhstan has a kind of a unique position that, that having all of those things in the same place and having a small, very highly educated population uh, with a little bit of makeover and a little bit of input from outside, I think we can have a step change. I'm going to bring Aset Magoff in and I'm going to bring Matthew Sagers in, but before I do that, I want to bring you in. And the question is, we'll ask this question now and then perhaps we'll ask this question later, but I'm curious, raise your hand if you think that the kind of energy shift that we're talking about up here is going to fundamentally affect your life during your life. Raise your hand if the answer is yes. Hi, 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 so I can see. <laughs> raise your hand if the answer is no. Wow. So a lot of you don't have an opinion? Raise your hand at once. Raise your hand if the answer is yes. You think this is going to affect your life in a fundamental way? Why? Come on, hi. Suddenly people got more optimistic. Okay, and then raise your hand if the answer is no. Okay, good. So maybe 60-40. So it's a somewhat skeptical audience. You have a lot of convincing to do, Minister. So I want to bring I want to bring Asad Magalf in. I want to bring Matthew Sagers in. And I want to just shift this a little bit. And what I want to ask you guys is, what is the motive? We've Каким heard people sit here and discuss whether what, what, what might мы, happen, um, мы слышим, but, but uh, why uh, is it that Kazakhstan and more broadly the world is talking about a shift in energy sources? Is the motive climate change? Is the motive air pollution? Is the motive wanting to be a technological leader? Is the motive energy security questions? What, what is it other than all of the above? What's the driving factor? Uh, this question, the question uh, 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 regarding the transit to the green energy and the energy efficiency was raised at a good time because here we see when we analyze our industry that we have great reserves in our, in our economy and we can do a lot in terms of energy efficiency. We still have many questions regarding the environmental uh, friendly attitude towards different products and production. And uh, the idea is that the Minister of Environmental Protection came up with are very timely and we support all these ideas and it's true that uh, Kazakhstan is a big uh, producer of oil, uh, oil um, gas and we do have big plans for the future uh, development and uh, really the question why do we move from the uh, traditional energy uh, resources to the renewable ones and I think that oil and gas and coal are all good export products and thanks to the world crisis uh, uh, oil, we can have more uh, economic uh, profit uh, on this. At the same time, uh, we're moving towards the green economy. Uh, 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 uh,
we can do a lot in terms of integration of uh, traditional uh, energy. We can also introduce the uh, new filters. We can improve all the uh, technical enterprises. And the industry uh, in general is very energy. Которые предъявляют uh, большие требования к источникам электроэнергии, and, uh, которые должны быть many, базовыми станциями, надежными и достаточно many, маневренными. Many, many в этих условиях, конечно, мы полагаем, что в какой-то среднесрочной перспективе традиционные источники энергии должны оставаться превалирующими. Но с учетом того... Dominant, but... oh. Oh. So, let, that, that's actually... They want you to shut your phone. Yeah, that's that's actually fascinating. So that if I understand it correctly, then the motive is it's a hedge. It's a hedge on energy sources. That Kazakhstan, uh, at the end of the day, wants to preserve its oil and gas for maximal economic benefit to export onto the world market. And to the extent that Kazakhstan produces more energy from other sources domestically, that leads Kazakhstan more to export at world prices. So, Matt, jump in. Actually, one of the thoughts that I was going to have too is that basically I can see green being very important in terms of domestic consumption, freeing up these materials that basically demand a high price in the world market. But I think that one of the other key motivations, uh, which the, the minister touched on, was uh, a theory that we would call peak oil, which is that we're running out. Therefore, we've got to put in some other stuff, a sort of edge. We're talking about something that is uh, very uncertain, term in terms of how things are going to work out. But basically, to show you how uncertain things are, the single biggest energy revolution of this century has been the unconventional revolution in hydrocarbons. It has not been a change in terms of photovoltaic or wind or anything like that. It's been, we've been able to produce oil and gas from stuff that we didn't think we could produce oil and gas from. And it's, it's brought about a, a very, very dramatic change uh, in terms of the United States and its energy situation overall. Uh, the United States is now really rising very rapidly in terms of oil production. Gas is now third of, of uh, national production and going to 50 percent. And so suddenly the motivation that we had before, which is, oh my gosh, we're running out of oil and gas, suddenly you've got this, this other wrench thrown in, which is maybe we aren't. Maybe we can find more ways of producing these traditional hydrocarbons that have always been there. And once again, a, a more environmentally uh, beneficial way, improve energy efficiency and so forth, make that stuff stretch so, a little so Matt, longer. Matt, let, me just, let me just push you for a second. So you're describing this extraordinary revolution technologically in the United States, which has turned the United States uh, essentially around in terms of its energy picture. Predictions are that the U.S. is going to be basically the world's biggest producer of oil, uh, biggest ex a, a massive exporter of natural gas. Five years ago, the expectation was that the United States would have to import natural gas. Right. An extraordinary change. So what I want to ask you, though, is you've heard the minister say that there's an expectation in Kazakhstan that there's a certain period at the end of which uh, Kazakhstan will, will at least run out of cheap oil. Um, what does the U.S. Does the US experience suggest that, that, that that's not an accurate prediction, that indeed it may emerge that technology happens and suddenly Kazakhstan is swimming in more oil and gas than it thinks now? I think the answer is we just simply don't know kind of what the future will bring. So therefore, we've got to have some, some hedges uh, and uh, some, some flexibility. But the view that there is going to be no more oil is something that you probably should put in a, a, a bucket somewhere because that's probably... That, that single notion is probably not true. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me, for example, to find out that Kazakhstan has a lot of unconventional resources as well, just simply because of its huge land territory. It just sort of stands for reason that it's probably got a significant amount of, of this stuff anyway. And uh, so, so therefore, it's, it's probably likely that these hydrocarbons are going to stay around for a lot longer than what we even thought. Uh, yes, they're going to be a little bit more expensive. And then once again, we're looking at a future where uh, hydrocarbon costs go up. 
и цены на углеводородные, скорее всего, повысятся. Если мы привлекать новые энергии, зеленые энергии, то цены, конечно, будут меняться. И все это может быть достаточно благоприятно. Позвольте мне даже перебить вас. Мы говорим... You want one of those up there? Yeah. Two percent briefly in terms of solar and wind. Whereas, if you're looking at generation, power generation, if you're looking at increasing energy efficiency, you're talking ten percent, twenty percent, thirty percent. So increases in energy efficiency, making better insulation in your buildings, making buildings more energy efficient. You save much more energy than you generate from. больше энергии, чем мы можем создать so, one, из возобновляемых источников энергии. Второе. That my colleague from Syria is talking about has a very important lesson for Kazakhstan and for other countries. And that is, it was bottom up; it was not top down. It was technology and entrepreneurship and property rights that fuel that. It was not a decision in the capital, Washington, that told people now you go and you produce shale gas. People are producing. Mostly from private land. And we have land rights. Those people who own that land get a revenue, so they have an interest in putting a rig and inviting a company and a new share. And your view for Kazakhstan as a result of that is what? What is the point of that for Kazakhstan? The point is let the private sector play a role. Make sure that the property rights are protected. Okay, so I want us to jump into this question of how how are renewables pushes playing out around the world. But before I do that, I just want to ask um, Mr. McGough and, and Minister Kaparov, both of you, um, what in your view are the implications for Kazakhstan and more broadly for the global oil and gas market of the kind of U.S. shale gas revolution that, that, that Matt and, uh, and Ariel talked about? Um, is it a good thing for Kazakhstan? Is it a potentially threatening thing, the rise of the U.S. as a producer? Whichever of you would like to jump in. I think that the U.S. example of shale gas revolution is extraordinary and this is good for Kazakhstan. First of all, the gas price in the U.S. dropped fourfold, I think. In our terms, it's about $100 per BCM now versus $400 per BCM before. So, of course, the consumers are benefiting from it. And, uh, of course, the uh, environment starts to get better because shale gas uh, revolution helped to shift, uh, to shift uh, from coal power generation partly into gas power generation. So, uh, as, uh, as I heard, uh, uh, the latest number, that 200 gigawatt of coal, uh, coal power generation is getting replaced by gas power generation. And gas power generation uh, produces two times less CO2 emissions. And, uh, and SOX NOX is almost... Uh, uh, just SOX and NOX. So, and in, in regard with SOX and NOX, it's nothing. Almost nothing. It's basically the stuff that you can see and smell. Yes. <laughs> That's so, the technical term, I think. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. SOX yeah. NOX means... Uh, 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 Sulfur, uh, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide. Uh, yeah. 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 So, um, basically, uh, and in addition, uh, if, you do, if you talk about solar power generation or wind, they are not stable energies. And they always need a backup. And the best backup for them is a gas power generation. Because gas turbines are very flexible. And in five minutes they can go up or down in production. So they can be adjusted uh, uh, to the renewables. So what, what actually coal, can, coal plants cannot do. So that's why the gas power generation is considered 
Министр, the best friend of uh, renewables. And again, uh, just because of the develop uh, more renewables, you need, uh, uh, you need a strong backup, and the best backup is the energy. backup is the gas power generation. Is, uh, and in regards to Kazakhstan, uh, we, we, as the Minister, we raise that issue that we should explore. Министерство охраны природы мы говорим о том, что мы должны исследовать все возможности, хотя зачастую это не рассматривается как технологии для шелга, но мы считаем, что в Казахстане также есть большие запасы газа, и мы должны изучить возможности использовать газ в Казахстане, и в основном зависит газа находится в северном Казахстане. Because our main gas production is the western part of Kazakhstan. That's why it might give us, if we have really shale gas, of course we, it will be, and if it is, if it is cheap, it might, it might be expensive, it might be cheap, depends on how it lies down in the, uh, the, uh, the ground. But uh, basically if it's cheap, then it might change our picture, uh, so we can increase gas production, gas power generation on the north and east part of Kazakhstan. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, when we replace some coal Конечно power plants, so the coal industry, industry might industry suffer industry a bit, industry but industry the coal workers, so Но, uh, basically new, uh, new uh, jobs will be created in uh, shale gas, which is in the same region as the where the coal, uh, go coal uh, basins are. Uh, uh, so I'm going to stop you there, and I want to actually I want to tweak the question I want to ask Mr. McGough, and that is I want to follow up on what you said. So Mr. McGough, you had a trade association that includes gas producers and oil producers and coal producers, among many other industries in the energy system. So what is it like hurting those cats, as we say in the United States? What is it like, what, what we're talking about here is a potentially significant energy shift, which has the potential to injure some of your trade association's members. If Kazakhstan is producing 50% of, of, of its energy from renewables, that's, that's less that the gas producers and oil producers are selling, at least domestically. Is there any concern on the part of any of your members that this is a losing proposition for them economically? экономический ущерб нанесен в этом случае? Ну, с точки зрения вот э... с точки зрения того, что э, в США произошла фланцевая революция и в США уже перестали импортировать газ. Действительно, в ближайшем периоде мы увидели, что традиционные поставщики газа переориентировали свои поставки на другие рынки, в том числе на Европу. Есть определенная информация, что поставщики угля, которые традиционные были на рынке США, сейчас свои поставки угля на Европу переориентировали. И, конечно же, для нашей компании, которая в ассоциацию входит, являются энергопроизводящими компаниями, продавцами нефти, газа. Для них, конечно же, могут быть вопросы по сбыту газа, по цене на газ. Вместе с тем, на данном этапе Казахстан не является большой газопроизводящей страной. Мы в год порядка 30 миллиардов кубов газа производим. Достаточно небольшой объем. Большую часть употребляется самими нефтедобывающими компаниями. В долгосрочном плане, конечно, наши три больших месторождения должны будут уже перейти от закачки газа к производству товарного газа. Здесь вопрос цены на газа и рынка сбыта газа будет более остро стоять. Тем более, что на данной стадии уже будет производство нефти на этих месторождениях значительно меньше, будет большей частью газ производиться. С учетом содержания меркоптанов, сероводорода, потребуются большие инвестиции в строительство газоперерабатывающих мощностей. Сама по себе себестоимость такого товарного газа будет уже большой. И, соответственно, предложение на внутренний рынок или на экспорт будет уже исходить, отталкиваться в том числе от себестоимости такого газа. Но с точки зрения экологии, конечно, здесь наличие товарного газа на внутреннем рынке, оно позволяет больше развивать альтернативную энергетику, так как можно развивать маневренные мощности по генерации электроэнергии. И в целом, конечно же, генерация на газе, она меньше вреда для экологии наносит. So the, so the, the view that you're hearing here is that the increased production in gas, not just in the United States, but, but globally and, and, and more and more in Kazakhstan as well, is an enabling technology for renewable energy. Um, that, that, at least in the view of this panel, it's not a conflict, it's complementary. Um, I think, yeah, Siddharth, jump in here. Yeah. I, I, 
I have a slightly more skeptical view of okay. Shellgas uh, book. Uh, because um, there are, of course, a lot of good things about it, but the whole discourse of Shellgas is driven by a political uh, discussion and international relations and geoeconomics and geopolitical dimension of who wants a secure energy supply and who doesn't and who will be the provider and who will be the consumer. And, 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 and in fact, we realign uh, the chessboard of and that rush, uh, we're forgetting uh, certain other more detailed aspects. First of all, we haven't really understood what is the environmental impact of the, of the shell gas fraction processes, particularly to do with water, particularly with Central Asia, but also United States. I mean, the, uh, both areas that have water wars of different varieties uh, hidden and, and open ones, and I think shell gas is quite closely linked to that. The, the, just be specific about the water issue you're raising. Are you raising the question of the amount of water that, that shale gas production uses? Or are you raising the question of pollution of water? Or? I, I, I'm, I'm raising initially, I mean, uh, primarily uh, the, 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 the water that is needed for the, for the fracking technologies and so on. And of course, in certain parts of the world, you can have it very refined one. But there are other parts of the world where people are just, as is, as was explained, that, that the private, small, private sector people are getting into it without regulation, without understanding what the technology will do to that particular area and so on. Okay, so one of your concerns is the potential environmental downsides of shale gas production. Does the concern about gas go beyond that? And, and combined with that is the, the flip side, which is equally worrying, is that since we're moving so fast into it, uh, and since it's providing us a ready solution, in, at least in at the level of mine, that we're, not look, we're backing away from making more efficient use of gas technologies because that gets put, put back on the back burner. And that in long term, I think that is going to be a big, big damaging thing. And the final point in that is that we, driven by the supply language globally, about, uh, because which is coming largely from outside, uh, from, has come from outside from where people produce things, we are not thinking about how we use the gas and how we use the energy, and, and instead of trying to develop technologies which will use energy efficiently, we need to move to a new paradigm where we build around the energy supply resource and see what technologies can be we build around that to both extract, use and supply and store that. And thus, the, the point the minister made regarding um, uh, what uh, the backup the gas backup. The gas backup is fine, but again, uh, there's other backup. The large batteries, the, uh, all of those other kind of backup, integrating solar with wind, integrating technologies again, being pushed out of the, the stream. So, so that's a, this is a really interesting point that one hears a lot in the global energy debate. And the, the, the phrase that in the United States people talk about is natural gas is a blue bridge to a green future. And the question that people ask is how long is the bridge? Is the bridge so so long that it pushes uh, off a, a, an ostensibly greener future. Uh, Minister, you want to jump in here. I want to comment. Uh, uh, everyone wants to jump uh, in here. <laughs> First of all, it was rightly said that there, are, there is a flip side of the shale gas. Uh, because uh, shale gas production consumes a lot of water. And Kazakhstan will be, will be, uh, will be, ha will be facing tremendous problems with water supply. So today, water supply and water demand is equal. But our projections, if we do nothing, in 2050, we will have water supply three times less than water demand in Kazakhstan. Which means that we water supply three times less than water demand. Yes, if we, if we do nothing, if we don't introduce green economy, if we don't change our lifestyle, if we do as we do. But of course, with the green economy, no, with green technology, we can change that picture with introducing water saving technologies, etc. So, the green technologies in water and agricultural sector might change the picture. Uh, but, of course, we'll be saving every drop of water in future. So, of course, uh, consuming too much water for shale gas production will be an issue if we develop shale gas industry. Uh, but, there are, what, I, what I understand, there are late Latest technologies in shale gas production, maybe uh, uh, our colleague from IHSR can uh, define it, that uh, they, 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 there are latest technologies with, which don't consume much water or they don't, con don't consume water at all. This is kind of a question. And, um, 
So we'll be investing more in less developed regions through the green, uh, green uh, technologies. And, and in those regions, for example, some regions they are uh, they're good in at wind, and some regions are good at uh, solar. So from our point of view, gas power generation is the best backup. And uh, you rightly said, there is, a, uh, there, is an uh, there is an expression actually in our green economy uh, concept which we just developed that Kazakhstan will be going uh, uh, into green energy uh, through, the, uh, through gas. So basically, gas is a bridge to, uh, towards uh, renewables. So we cannot jump from coal straight to renewables. It's impossible. So, we, the, so gas is a bridge, basically. So because of the backup. And indeed, I just want to throw out two numbers that the Kazakh uh, government has, has, has articulated. We, we talked earlier about the, the, the president's uh, aspiration of 50 percent of the country's energy coming from uh, not, well, renewables and nuclear by, by 2050. Just as an indication of what that glide path might look like, the, 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 the aspiration is 1 percent by 2014 and 3 percent by 2020, ultimately at 50 percent by 2050. So if, forgive me, but if we're looking at a piece of paper here, we're talking about like this and presumably like that, right? And the question is, I guess, how does this happen now? We're going to talk about, we have not a lot of time left, and I promise we're going to get to this question in the context of what the experience has been elsewhere. But I want, um, Matt, you've been quiet over there, and I want to bring you in on, 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 on two questions quickly. The, one the minister talked about, which is, um, what's your sense of, uh, and Ariel, I know you want to jump in, and Asad, I know you want to jump in too, but your sense of, 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 of fracking technologies that are um, less environmentally problematic. But number two, your sense globally of the effect of of the natural gas, the increase in natural gas production on renewables. To what extent have they been an enabler? To what extent have they been an, imp an impeder? Let me uh, sort of address the, the one question first. Typically, with, with all technologies, you drive to, to try and minimize whatever your, your, your most costliest element is. Um, if it's water, you try to minimize water. If it's, if it's uh, rare earth metals, you try and minimize that as well. And in some cases, in, in places in the United States, there has been problems with water. And in a lot of cases, it's not about the big overall balance. It's about moving the water right directly to the well. So you want to try and minimize that. And so there has been and people that have experimented with doing it and, and so on. So it's, it's not necessarily a, a game ender or anything like that. I think that uh, one of the other things to keep in mind here is uh, probably a person that, that probably would not be exactly popular to, to quote Mao. Uh, let a thousand flowers bloom. Um, given the fact that we're not quite sure how things are going to work out, let's move in all the kinds of directions. Let, let's don't foreclose any particular line of development, and we'll see how these different parts end up uh, fitting together and complementing each other and so forth. And a lot of it has to do with uh, something that, that you said earlier, which is let's free up the entrepreneurs and let them, let them put this stuff together and, and sort of uh, fit the stuff as well. Uh, I think that one of the other things as we, as we think about the, the unconventional revolution, sort of what it means for Kazakhstan, I think there's 
two key things here. One is that that factor of four that we drove prices down in the United States, well, that also means that globally the value of Kazakhstan's resources in the ground are a whole lot less than they were before because the overall game has changed in terms of what those hydrocarbons are worth. The other key thing that's happened, and, and just so what does that mean? What is the implication of that? of that reduction the, in the value of the The traditional resource holders of the world in the Middle East, Russia, Kazakhstan, and so forth, the value of that resource is a lot less than it was before because the places that didn't have the resources before, United States, China, and so forth, they now might have the ability to produce that stuff right in situ. The other no, but let me just, but what I'm, what I'm asking is, let's assume that that's right. What is the, what is the fact of that reduction in value mean for what countries should and shouldn't do in terms of diversity? diversifying their, their energy system. Well, I think that, that clearly at the moment oil has a, a, a total cachet, oil has a much higher value, gas at the moment is becoming like a ubiquity. Uh, where it's becoming increasingly common, found in a lot of places, and, and therefore it's, it's probably something you don't want to develop for a big-time export. Uh, something to keep at home, make bread with, <laughs> and so forth. But I think that the other key element that's happened in terms of Kazakhstan is that uh, the, the uh, unconventional revolution in the United States has suddenly meant that a lot of these independent producers that were out searching all the world, looking for hydrocarbons in all kinds of places, in difficult places. Uh, they can now come back home to the United States, uh, invest in a, a, a fairly benign uh, investment environment, uh, and make a decent return. That means that a lot of the places in the world that were basically exploiting that, that extreme need of these companies to basically find and discover hydrocarbons, it means that a lot of the host countries are now going to find themselves clear the change that they've done in terms of tax take and, and investment concerns, so that they're no longer competitive with the United States, uh, because the United States kind of sets the bar in terms of where people are doing incrementally. And so that means that uh, companies don't have to come to Kazakhstan, they can go to North Dakota and, and so forth. So I think that that's also a very fundamental thing to think about in terms of what it means for Kazakhstan. So there's two key elements there. So, so I want to, I want to, um, everyone's jumping, uh, j jostling to get in here, which is great, but I want to steer this a little bit because there's one thing that we've not really talked much about and that is, in fact, what the experience has been both in Kazakhstan and around the world in trying to ramp up renewable energy. Um, and just to set this as a frame, it seems to me that analysts at CIRA and elsewhere have, have, have concluded that the cost of, for instance, wind and solar technology has come down dramatically in the last few years, that there are a precious few places in the world where, to the minister's point, I think uh, uh, some of those technologies are competitive uh, with conventional technologies where the conditions are right, um, but that generally around the world those are still more expensive than conventional technologies. Um, uh, but what I want to ask specifically no, about is not so much the technologies, but the policies and financial mechanisms that are used to try to scale those technologies up. I think if you look around the world, there's a kind of a reset button being pressed in a lot of places. Throughout Europe, we talked about the feed-in tariff in Germany, Spain, Italy, China is going through a really interesting shift in policy on renewables. The United States is. A question about whether the policies that have been in effect to try to ramp up renewables thus far have been as efficient economically as they could be, whether they've generated as much bang for the buck as they could. And so I, I'll stop, but, but the question I have is in that context, um, what is your view of um, what the history of the renewables push says about how effective it's been in, in, in scaling these technologies up and what the lesson then is for a country like Kazakhstan uh, or for other countries, but Kazakhstan being at just the start of this. So who wants to jump in? Has it worked or has it not worked? In what way, let's be more specific, what, how could it have worked better? Anywhere, anyone, around the world. Siddharth, do you want to jump in? Uh, just, uh, it, it, it's not directly answering the question, but uh, it's raising for the point that if you look at around the world, the experience of technology procurement, not just in, in environmental and green technologies, but overall, has been driven by the fact that what capacity the state and the regulators have 
Which one is good for you? Is it the, the one? Is it, is it a good вас? salesman comes in and sells you, Хорошо for example, a train uh, uh, on Kazakh or Uzbek step, uh, which is perfectly made for, for Northern European Siemens climate? Will it work? Kazakhstan made a very good, good decision in finding the right one for itself. Building that capacity to select right technology uh, for your particular environment and your economic and financial system is, is a key thing. Second thing is that if that technology can be, as, as you Said, can it be scaled to the particular purpose and, it, and will it make the right business case to bring the right financial investment in? For example, uh, 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 lesson from home. So in Cambridge we have developed for a number of years a whole portfolio of technologies from plastic solar cells to superconducting things and so on and so on and so on. But these technologies are fantastic. Um, so stop for a second, just to define yeah. terms. Sure. Plastic solar cells are advantageous uh, compared to traditional solar cells. Why, theoretically? Uh, uh, there, there, there are two reasons. First, uh, they're, they're easier to make. Uh, and Kazakhstan, for example, as I said earlier, with this polymer wealth uh, and, and rare earth metals can actually move into that much faster. Uh, the, mo the other key thing is that looking at Kazakhstan, which is largely a rural country with large land area, the traditional solar cells are simply heavy made of metal and silicon. To retrofitting them into household is where real cost lies. Can people afford them? Can government subsidize that? So, so you, when you bring in something like a plastic solar cell, which is easier. Uh, in fact, to, to you, we were talking earlier, and you made to me the fascinating point uh, about the inability of many structures in Kazakhstan to withstand the weight of a traditional solar cell. So let's just, everyone can probably picture a solar cell, but a solar cell is what about the, about the size of sort of the size of, the size of one of these chairs made of heavy glass and heavy metal, expensive machinery, and so what Siddharth is talking about here is technological innovation that would allow you to capture the sun's energy and converted into electricity, yeah. but in a way that is much more adaptable and theoretically much cheaper. So continue with your story. So, so you're, you're, you've developed this technology in Cambridge, and then what? Well, the, 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 the plastic solar cells can be less efficient than the other ones. However, you, since they're lighter and simpler, you can make more of them. You can literally print them out and, and, and install them. The, 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 the bottom line being that, that such a technology can, uh, is entirely useless for UK or Northern Europe, although we have developed it. So we can't, we, there's no investment, no financial, investment, no financial incentive to put more money and make it useful. But this is where countries like Kazakhstan come in. Well, there's a, but the reality is you try to do this here and it's not going very far, right? Well, well, we, we, we need to, well, <laughs> we're discussing, uh, and I, 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 I'm, I'm hopeful, and not just, not, not just Cambridge, actually, the German uh, companies which are into this. We hold the IP, but the, the manufacturers can come from China, Germany, wherever else. The whole point being that these are unique technologies and you need procurement ex expertise inside the country to say, yes, not the proven solar one, I mean the silicon one, maybe we can try something new. But that's for innovation, the new uh, development of new sort of expertise within the universities and industrial sector and leading to a kind of a step change in how you can use these technologies. But not just the solar cells, they are in, in rare metals, they are in, they are in, uh, in, in wind technologies and so on. So there, there's a whole portfolio of these. And the point is that the technology that we see today isn't necessarily the end game technologically. There's exactly. And the question is how you select it. What, yeah. what capacity you have to select what is good for you. So Ariel is going to jump out of his chair if I don't call him. And I just want to clear relevance to what uh, uh, the colleague said. And that is that today both uh, solar and wind are very exciting in the sense that the, the price per kilowatt is going down, the technology is developing. But there is a huge technological challenge. Just like it, we used to have a challenge with shale that we didn't know how to extract oil and gas from shale or tide oil. We don't know how to store energy that would generate uh, and it is intermittent. It's when, when you fire up uh, a fossil uh, energy plant, a gas plant or a coal plant, you can produce energy as much as needed at the level that you need, and then, let's say at night you don't need as much, you reduce the production. With solar, 
Но когда речь идет о солнечной энергии, мы не можем контролировать облака пока еще. Мы не можем произвести столько энергии, сколько мы сами хотим. Мы не можем никак контролировать уровень производства. В некоторых местах, да, мы можем, например, в Саудовской Аравии можно это сделать. Когда только 3 или 5 дней в году у них небо закрыто облаками, но в других странах нет никаких погодных условий, то контролировать это не будет возможно. И это нужно все принимать во внимание. То же самое касается и хранения энергии. Это все это еще является всем существующим на данный момент существующим. It will be still a drawback for these particular types of energy, and you still need a backup, either gas or coal, that you can fire up when the sun is not shining at night. You cannot get solar energy, right? Or when there's no wind, you don't get wind energy. So you always need that backup, and you need to build a more Smart, smarter grid, more modern grid that you can shift energy from place to place. So I want to, I want to. So we've talked for the past couple of minutes about technology, technological promise, and technological difficulty or challenges. I want to bring us back for just a minute or two to talk about the efficiency of policies to try to deploy these technologies. Minister, you mentioned that the feed-in tariff is being considered in Kazakhstan. Someone mentioned the feed-in tariff in Germany and elsewhere in Europe, and someone can talk to this. Perhaps, but indeed, maybe Mr. Magath, you can talk to the experience of regulation with renewable energy elsewhere and what Kazakhstan is trying to do. But I think it's fair to read what's happened elsewhere as governments were very optimistic about subsidies for these technologies, and when the economy changed, governments got less generous with these technologies. They pulled back on some of those incentives, which has created real problems for these technologies globally. And so it's in this context. Text, the Kazakhstan is considering what to do. Mr. Magov, do you want to talk here about what is, what is, what is the most efficient way for Kazakhstan to go about, in a policy sense, subsidizing these technologies without over-subsidizing them, which seems elsewhere to have led to a kind of a backlash against these technologies? Себестоимость производства электроэнергии из возобновляемых источников энергии снижается. Вместе с тем большая разница с традиционными источниками генерации остается. И все больше использование альтернативных источников энергии, за исключением атомной электроэнергии, оно, конечно, повышает требования в целом к энергосистеме Казахстана. С точки зрения вот то, что уже говорили э, коллеги о том, что нужны маневренные мощности, нужны, э, энергосистема должна оперативно очень э, подключать другие источники энергии, то есть развитие Smart Grid. И э, без э, какого-то нового технологического скачка избежать использования маневренных мощностей невозможно. То есть это вопрос накопления энергии, использования каких-то новых технологий, конденсаторов или других технических решений. Без них, я думаю, какого-то большого скачка в использовании альтернативной энергии добиться будет сложно. В отношении тарифов, конечно же, это сейчас вот раз обсуждаются вопросы, чтобы равномерную нагрузку на всех потребителей электроэнергии переложить той части, в которой себестоимость электроэнергии из альтернативных источников дороже, чем от традиционной. Я думаю, это при тех масштабах использования возобновляемых источников, это, я думаю, не такая большая нагрузка. Главное, чтобы мы в период, пока себестоимость производства электроэнергии из возобновляемых будет снижаться, в этот период Казахстан мог накопить необходимый технический опыт, мог бы решить вопросы регулирования, тарифа образования. Еще большая задача, мы в Казахстане должны создать рынок электрической мощности. То есть у нас создан рынок непосредственно самой электроэнергии, но рынок энергетической мощности до сих пор еще в стадии обсуждения и еще не, раз не заработал. Без него э, добиться того, чтобы на рынке присутствовали маневренные генерирующие мощности, добиться будет сложно.
Minister, Minister Kaparov, I just want to ask you to address this. Um, what lesson do you take from the policy debates elsewhere and the, 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 the lessons around the world with regard to subsidies for renewables? To what extent has Kazakhstan learned anything from that in trying to re repair some of the problems to the extent problems have happened elsewhere? Um, first of all, we then should talk about food and tariffs so of course, uh, any uh, renewable producer or investor needs guaranteed sales of its electricity, otherwise an investor won't invest. Uh, so feed-in tariff is considered the best, most successful model because it guarantees, it guarantees uh, payback. So basically, you give, uh, uh, you give a guaranteed tariff for an, to, to an investor. Uh, uh, for example, in Kazakhstan, we consider uh, 19 tenge, 18 tenge for wind, for example, for 15 years. So the, the investor will be guaranteed that he will be paid 18 tenge for, for, a, for a price uh, for a certain period of time, for 15 years. And that will give him uh, a certain IRA, it will give him a payback. And he is uh, fine. A certain internal rate of return, a certain profitability. Right. profitability. So, of course, that will attract foreign investment uh, and our local and foreign investment because people will jump in it. How do you avoid overpaying? If, if you that's, why, that's why we, we coming back to another question of yours about the curve, how fast we go. That's why we, we, only, we want to start modestly. So we decided that only 3% the uh, electricity share will be by 2020, which means about 660 kilowatt, um, uh, uh, megawatt by, by 2020, uh, with about, say, um, uh, about 1,000 or 1,100 uh, uh, megawatt uh, that's what we will start with. And according to, uh, to the uh, industry, industry specialists, after 2020, it will be the major uh, development of renewables. And is the theory that, that at that point the technology will be a lot cheaper than it is now? If, taking, uh, I mean, if you take an analysis of the uh, technology development uh, from, for, for, for the last 20, 30 years, huh. so that could go down and down. So basically the point where, where uh, renewables will meet the uh, price of the coal or gas power generation will be between 2020 and 2030 in Kazakhstan, somewhere in between that, huh. which means that the most investment and the most shift we should do there. And if today we have to, to give uh, 17 tenge guaranteed, for example, for wind, uh, uh, or more than 30 tenge for, for solar, it, it, after 2020 it will be much cheaper, maybe we don't need any feed and tariff at all, because they will be installed automatically within the current price range. So that's, I'm going to stop you, I'm gonna, we're going to open this up, but I, that's actually fascinating. It's an interesting, for, so, to the extent that people thought that, that, that this future energy discussion was a matter of flipping a switch and tomorrow everything is going to be powered by solar panels and wind turbines, what the minister has essentially outlined here is a very, very, very gradual path. Um, and the plan is that at some point the technology will be such that you can ramp up that path. So I'm going to actually, I know everyone wants to jump in, but these guys, I, I have to tell you before we open this up that if no one raises their hand, I will feel like an utter failure here for the last hour. As will everyone up here, and you don't want that to happen. So please raise your hands. We have a good bit of time. Uh, yes, if you could just stand up and maybe identify. I think there are microphones. Are there microphones? And, and do me, if you could identify yourself and organization or business, that would be great. And if, it, lastly, if, if there's a particular person you want to address the question to, thanks. My name is Mirojek Mirbaeva. I'm a graduate student at John Hopkins. Uh, my particular interest is in electric power sector. I'm sorry. In, in uh, my interest, my research interest is uh, electric, um, electric power sector. And when we talk, uh, when we talk about 50 percent substitution, here. Do we talk about electricity or do we talk about um, energy? energy? 
in general, because at the moment we cannot speak about uh, renewables in uh, transportation. We, we talk about electricity. Only electricity. So that's quite a like, substantial uh, figure. So my question is, now we are talking about what has to be done, and only uh, Dr. Cohen touched on the question of how that to be done. So my question is, um, talking about feeding tariffs and other motivations uh, is kind of putting a cart before the horse, because do we have uh, enough infrastructure, do we have human resources, is our grid ready uh, for integration with the new renewables, uh, do we uh, work on improvement of uh, the estimation of the loads, are we ready for the uh, smart grid. Okay, I'm going to stop you. That, that, that's a, thank so you. What are the practical steps that right. are done in order to bring uh, this, to introduce this 50% right. so, 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 the, so Kazakhstan passes the feed-in tariff, the subsidies are in place, and then what happens? Everyone holds their breath. And oh, how are we going to introduce the feed-in tariffs if we don't have a connection? How are we going to what? How are we going to introduce the feed-in Reduce the feed -in tariffs. Okay, if who wants to take this question? How do you do the feed -in tariff if, if what? If we still don't have uh, integration in place. No, we, uh, yes, we don't have uh, an industry at all, so we are starting it. So it's almost zero. We just we just built the first uh, uh, solar power plant uh, for one megawatt in, in Jambul region and as well as one and a half megawatt uh, wind, uh, two turbines uh, in, uh, also in Jambul region. That's all we have in Kazakhstan. But if we don't, if we don't stand, if we, if we, if we don't start start uh, doing something, it will never happen, right? So we should, through the feed-in tariff, we're, we will attract investors, local foreign investors, who will start creating uh, the projects. Uh, and there are already pretty good uh, volume, uh, number of investors who are willing to do that. And of course, they will then gradually will develop the expertise and local knowledge and local, uh, local capacity, which will be doing that. Uh, it's a good question, of course. We don't have industry at all. That's why we don't have skills, we don't have people. But they will come up as soon as we start the industry. For example, in Jambul region, uh, there already these two projects, they already have some teams, so it's already 10, 20 guys who are doing that, they understand how to do that, so they are learning. So the more projects we do, and the 600 megawatts in 2020, we'll create already a pretty good knowledge of people in Kazakhstan competing with each other and having their uh, specialists and teams and, uh, and uh, uh, facilities, etc. So even the local production will, might come up. For example, we already have the the Astana Solar uh, Plant, which was developed by Kazakhstan Company, which is producing solar panels already in Kazakhstan by the latest technology. Solar factory. There are 50 or 100 people are working who are learning every day. So we already do have something, but it will come up, it will rise immediately as soon as you have the industry. Okay. Oil industry, for example, we, we had, uh, we had uh, some industry uh, since Soviet times, uh, because of Kachagan, Tengiz and Kachagan's development, today we have pretty big industry with pretty good knowledge and expertise, right? So you should start something, then, as you said, we should push the car, then the horse will come up in the front. That's the issue, right? Then the horse will come up in front of the car. So you should put the car before the horse, right? You should create the car, you should find the horse. Okay. Yeah, you guys are jumping. Okay, jump on and jump. What I'm going to say is just, just a few things. It's a process, very clearly. And sometimes the, the, the car is going to be in front of the horse, and sometimes the horse is going to be in you know, the, the really 
Сергей, иногда телега будет в коридоре лошади. Если вы посмотрите, каким образом это произошло в Европе, то вы можете посмотреть, что есть несколько критических моментов, где мы видим, что некоторая часть системы была дезбалансирована, что-то быстрее шло, что-то медленно, но все это процесс, это займет какое-то время, но нужно начать с чего-то, и нужно смотреть за различными элементами этой системы для того, чтобы все это двигалось гармонично. Too much of a feed-in, and you don't have enough backup to generate the full tariff over the entire month. So it's a process. It just moves along. So it's a process. It moves along. So it's a process. It just 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 moves касается замены нефти или угля или газа, чем-то совершенно новым. В Казахстане нет реактора, но это некий проект, который будет не People who have been educated in engineering, in physics, in economics of energy, and in management, because these are complex things. And the example of Spain spending seven billion euro a year and half of the country is bankrupt. Spain is serious, serious. Twenty-five, thirty percent unemployment, forty percent unemployment among the youth. Do you really have the money to continue spending on the solar feeding tariff? Not necessarily. So you need very high-level management, and I think with all the accomplishments that Kazakhstan has, there's a good chance that the management, the economics, the finances, and the regulation. Нужно работать над регуляторной базой, нужно разрабатывать механизмы, и все вместе мы надеемся, станет кейс-стади, и не таким, как Испания, которая является неудачным примером, а станет успешным примером. И еще очень кратко я бы хотела сказать, что нам нужно подумать о производстве. And, and with that, the, uh, the idea that what you have образом. and what you don't have, и and indeed, I, believe, I really believe in what Mr. said, and also what считаю, you said, that that we need to bring all, all the intellectual infrastructure, but the question is what kind of infrastructure. We have an interesting lesson from a place which is devastated, like Lebanon, the civil war. Из Ливана, который был абсолютно разрушен после гражданской войны. И не было даже телекоммуникации, телекоммуникации. Тем не менее, они проложили первые кабели, они являлись первыми пионерами в области проведения кабельного телекоммуникации. То есть, really инновации возникают зачастую из, из ниоткуда, и нужно быть готовым к этому, нужно great, быть готовым переписать свое прошлое. Other kind of technologies which complement and sometimes even subvert this thing is where Kazakhstan needs to look at being a very large country, a very sparse population. So the solutions from Spain may be a lesson, but not necessarily the solution for this country. Or we have not. Or any other thing to look at. Okay, so I want more questions. Sorry, I've got a question. You have a question. Yes, my name is Janar Bayzitova. I'm from the university. I've got a question regarding nuclear. My interest, study interest, is nuclear in the nuclear power plant on the territory of Kazakhstan. So, as I understood, you considering new revolution. Which you call shell gas revolution. It reminds me a little bit as a nuclear power renaissance. As I can understand, everybody 
насколько я понимаю, все уделяют большое внимание новым источникам энергии, таким как, например, сланцевый газ. А что же касается ядерной энергетики, вы забываете о том, что у нас очень богатые месторождения урана, и мы не можем отрицать этот факт. И это замечательная возможность получить So I've got a question to the minister. You know, why don't you consider nuclear power because it is environmentally friendly source of energy, except of radioactive phobia? Indeed. Radioactive phobia? Yes. We call it. Okay. Thanks. Okay, minister. But why not nuclear? How much nuclear? We do have plans as a government to develop nuclear industry, and in the in in our plans, we will have two gigawatts installed capacity by 2030. And just to be clear, the expectation is that means what of the generating mix, actual jobs? In 2030, it will represent about 7-8 percent out of 32 gigawatts. Then. Today we have 19 gigawatts, so we will need 32 gigawatts in 2030, and 2 gigawatts will represent about 7-8% of generation, of power generation. So we have that plan, and we already have in all our energy mix and in our energy basket plans to have that volume of nuclear, and it was rightly said we have uranium-rich country, and we we should have safe and good nuclear production. It's not environmentally that friendly. I mean, we call it low carbon. It's really low carbon production. But we should be careful with the waste treatment of the nuclear waste treatment after after decommissioning of such plants. So the waste treatment should be also included in business plans of such new projects to be developed. That's my answer. We have plans to develop the industry. So, Mr. Thank you. What I want to do is I'm going to impose a factoid to to what Minister said quickly. Yeah. That that apart from the plants and you apart from uranium wealth you have underground you have one of the largest uranium production facilities in the world as well. Uranium fuel cells in all the metallurgical plants from I mean supply the Arigua big production thing. So it's beyond just commodity of uranium but also production and so, so the, so the question is very right. I think, I think there's a great potential here, uh, but we have to do it right. That's another thing. Okay, other questions? Yeah, sir. Can everybody hear me? Uh, mine is more a statement than a, a question because we are on a delegation from South Africa. We operate in Africa representing a company called South, uh, South African Kazakhstan Investment Company. I think it's very obvious that there will be bridges to build between the various components, government, private partnership and investors. And it's very easy at these debates to say how do we get from the discussion into the actual investment. We are very excited by what's being discussed. We think there's enormous opportunity between the various countries, the various discussion topics that have been made. We look forward to engaging with the various people, and we believe that uh, the opportunities between uh, the various countries and the various investors means that we've got to get down around the table and look for opportunities as opposed to merely discussing. I think we should have off-site discussions and try and implement where there are opportunities because we're very excited by the current opposition, uh, propositions that have been Okay, so we're going to try to minimize the plugs and maximize the questions. Okay, questions in the back, please. Can someone get a microphone in the back, please? Yes, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, okay. And then we'll then you. Yeah. Мое имя Валерий Лукинчук, компания Vision Global Service. Я хотел бы обратить еще раз повторю моя Фамилия Лукинчук Валерий, компания Vision Global Service. Хотел бы обратить внимание присутствующих к одному очень важному аспекту. Это традиционные наши месторождения нефти и газа, их правильное, экологическое, оптимальное использование, увеличение извлекаемости из недр, что это очень важные вопросы. 
Свидетельством тому, что Казахстан, правительство Казахстана уделяет этому внимание, есть постановление 13 августа 2012 года о концепции развития геологической отрасли до 2030 года. Это очень актуальное постановление, которое говорит о необходимости сочетания традиционных методов разведки, эксплуатации и инновационных методов. И я скажу, что опыт нашей компании практически показывает, что применение новых методов, в частности разработанных нашими специалистами и используемых порядка 10 лет в России показывают очень хорошие эффективные результаты на пути снижения затрат на поиск, уменьшение времени поиска, экологичность в том плане, что нет необходимости сейсмической техники заезжать на территории заповедников и других вещей, обследование с легкомоторных самолетов или вертолетов. Это очень кратко. Рекламируем компании, я не хочу вас обидеть. Но есть вопрос у вас конкретный? Вопрос к участникам панели дискуссии. Какие практические меры правительство Казахстана по этому постановлению разработало и применяет? Кратенько. По постановлению 2012 года по развитию новых подходов к делу. Вопрос какой? Что там? Какие меры Казахстана, правительства Казахстана? Конкретно, пожалуйста, вопрос. Я не хочу, чтобы вот много... Мистер Магаф? Давайте... Может быть, господин Магалов, а мерка, ну, Вообще, конечно, не совсем относится к теме, наверное, сегодняшней сессии, но Министерство индустрии и новых технологий недавно презентовало изменения в текущий кодекс о недрах и недропользовании, чтобы стимулировать именно инвестиции в геологоразведку, чтобы инвесторов больше привлекать, именно дать им определенные гарантии, что после стадии разведки у них будет больше прав на заключение контракта на добычу. И они подготовили пакет законопроектных изменений, чтобы сделать именно как инвестиции в геологоразведку и в дальнейшую добычу полезных ископаемых более привлекательными. Okay, questions. Хорошо, вопрос. Пожалуйста, мне кажется, сзади человек хотел задать вопрос на заднем ряду, пожалуйста. Слышно, да? не вкладывает геолог Алло. Слышно, да? Раз мои юные коллеги энергетики представляются, что они закончили, я выпускница Московского энергетического института энергетики со стажем 45 лет. Вот мои юные коллеги по энергетике, они вместе начинали, когда я еще в Министерстве энергетики работал. Мне просто кажется, что прежде чем обсуждать вот такой стратегически важный вопрос, переход на зеленую энергетику и экономику, надо говорить о политической, экономической и социальной стабильности страны. Энергетика – это такая отрасль, это аксиома, это с ней, как сказать, просто моделировать, это очень опасно. Поэтому в Казахстане базовая энергетика является угольная энергетика. Все наши, как сказать, оборудование, опыт эксплуатации – это угольная энергетика. И вот недавно был национальный доклад КАЗЭНЕРЖИ. Там говорится, что в большой, далекой перспективе у нас будет угольная энергетика. Я вам напомню, что у нас из 69 станций электрических, 40 станций – это тепловые станции, ветроэнергетика – если, знаете, у нас была шутка, когда мы в Москве учили, что вместо обещанного коммунизма в 80-м году были Олимпийские игры. Я не верю, что в 50-м году 50% ВИА и Казахстан будет развитой страной. Надо очень осторожно. Поэтому, Асет Магавич, вы, мы с вами работали, когда вы еще из Москвы приехали. Я просто хочу сказать, что есть такой критерий энергетическая безопасность, энергетическая надежность. Вот ветростанция, какая бы она ни была дешевая, она будет удалена. Действительно, выпускница она задала вопрос, какая инфраструктура, чтобы выдать 50% мощности. Стать сети 500 киловольт должны быть. Это отдаленные районы будут. Поэтому, если бы, как бы, если даже нулевая стоимость этой ветростанции, ее нужно резервировать. Это называется резервы, горячий резерв. Okay. Все. Поэтому, мне кажется, когда рассуждается... Okay. Stop, stop, Большое спасибо, я хочу вас we, остановить. Я, мне, я рад слышать ваш вопрос. Я думаю, мы поняли, фактически вопрос заключается в том, is реалистично ли это. 50% uh, 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 реально ли это или нет? У вас хороший вопрос. Вот. Ну, Казахстан, uh, когда... Энергетическая система сегодняшняя наша 
планировалась, она планировалась в системе Советского Союза. То есть у Союза был большой госплан, и они говорят, вот давайте Казахстан будет угольная генерация, здесь мы то будем, здесь, здесь атомную будем ставить. То есть мы в той советской модели, у них были там угольным кластером генерации, поэтому и э, вокруг угольных бассейнов и строились наши промышленные предприятия, энергоемкие, такие как Кормет и так далее. Сегодня мы независимая страна, и сегодня мы должны по-новому взглянуть, не по-старосоветски, да, и сидеть на старой советской модели, придуманной, где мы являемся их кластером советским, да, большим. Сегодня у нас, в советское время у нас не было газа, например, да, у нас не было в таких объемах, в котором он сейчас будет. Если у нас столько газа, почему? А газ это очень хороший, тем более у нас дешевый газ, потому что он попутный, а не добычной. Почему нам не увеличить долю генерации на газе? И сидеть на, на генерации, которая 88% на угле, или там, я может ошибаюсь, там плюс-минус, это не стабильно, это не, как бы, не, не разумно, потому что надо диверсифицировать портфель генерации. То есть Нельзя сидеть только на одном источнике. Весь этот источник угольный, это еще из первой индустриальной революции. Да? А во второй индустриальной революции это уже вот нефть и газ были, газовая генерация появилась. Сейчас уже третья индустриальная революция начинается с возобновляемыми источниками, а мы все сидим на старой технологии угольной. Да? И а, весь мир движется в, на, в направлении диверсификации своего портфеля, да? а мы сидим на одной старой а, угольной генерации. Поэтому мы не говорим о том, что мы а, а, закроем нашу угольную промышленность. И мы вот в своих планах по зеленой экономике тоже расписали, что уголь останется базовой генерацией, и она останется, глав, останется главным источником энергии. Но нам нужно будет в ближайшие 20-30 лет два раза больше энергии производить, чем сегодня. Мы их опять на угле будем строить? Или мы подумаем о том, что мы будем дополнительные другие источники энергии вовлекать для того, чтобы у нас был сбалансированный портфель. Поэтому то, что мы рисуем в 50 году, иметь 50% на альтернативных, но там же будет и уголь, там же будет и газ. Вот. Тем более наши угольные станции, они, они, будут, они будут требовать модернизации и реконструкции в ближайшие 15-20 лет. Вот, и их надо будет уже на последней технологии переделывать, да? Вот там будет много работы э, э, этот, э, специалистам в угольной генерации, да? Перестроить все эти станции. Но наращивать дальше все на угле, это неразумно. Это не, ну, в смысле, э, так никто не делает. То есть надо балансированный, диверсифицированный портфель. И когда вы будете развивать все остальные, и атомную чуть-чуть, и возобновляемые источники энергии, и газовую, газовая будет... В принципе, она будет по цене конкурентна против угля. Вот мы посчитали, что если взять новую угольную станцию против новой газовой станции, они, эта газовая станция очень даже конкурентна. То есть у нас в старой советской экономике не было в то время невозобновляемых источников энергии. И в Казахстане тогда не было газа. Теперь он появился. Но почему бы, если весь мир на газе делает генерацию энергии, почему и мы не должны делать. Поэтому нам надо размазать этот портфель и сделать его на всех источников и играть на всех видах энергетических источников. I'm going to stop you. Thank you. Я хочу вас остановить. Спасибо. Есть у нас какая-то проблема. У нас буквально три минуты, и многие люди хотят задать вопросы. Поэтому я хочу принять практическое решение. Поэтому 30 секунд на вопросы, пожалуйста. Even, even less. Даже меньше. Uh, I mean, I, I made all the points. I think I've been related to what was asked already. И уже But двое человек задали general, вопросы. The, the, the idea of Но в целом идея policy, взаимоувязывания политики, стабильности к энергетическому и экономическому планированию. Необходимо, чтобы кто-то это делал. И сейчас мы находимся в том процессе, когда мы видим, что казахстанская сторона учитывает, хорошо двигается, у нас есть представители Министерства экологии, индустрии, они работают вместе. 
И теперь нам нужно понять, что такое политика. Мы видели часть документа, Price per kilowatt or per million BTUs is going down, and that the price of coal and gas, whatever, is continuing to be where where it is now, or at least not drop quickly or going up. Right now, we are not at the equilibrium between renewables and fossil. And that is a political decision, it is an economic decision. My position is, do not bankrupt yourself by jumping into the vast volume of renewables, build the human capital, build the expertise, and with that, I'll defer to the minister. So actually, I'm going to jump in, so I'm going to, uh, here's what we're going to do, because we're already over our time, but we're going to do two quick things. I want to ask each of you, as a kind of parting comment, to address very briefly the following question. I'm going to give you a minute to think about it, and then I'm going to ask the audience something, and we'll come back to you. And the question is this. How will an energy shift of the sort that we're talking about affect regular people? How might it affect them behaviorally? How might it affect them economically? How might it affect them in terms of environmental effects on them? Um, to what extent is, is the, is the, are these sorts of things relevant to the average person in, 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 let's say, the next 10 years? So think about that for a second. So I asked you a question at the start, which is, sorry, we, can't, we don't have any more time for questions, but I asked you a question at the start, which is, um, was, was this this energy shift, future energy, as it's being called here, is it going to affect you uh, in your lifetime? And we were at about 60-40, 60-40, yes, So let's redo the question. If you think that, uh, that this kind of an energy shift is going to affect you in a material way during your lifetime, raise your hand. Hi, 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 raise your hand high. Okay, if you think it will not, raise your hand. Если думаете, что нет, поднимите тоже руку. So, it's, it's, so, so this has been a, pers a, a persuasively optimistic crowd, I guess. Optimistic except that I think a lot of people aren't raising their hands. Люди, so so let's do it once more. Руки. Yes, Давайте raise your раз. hand. Да, если повлияет на вас, поднимите руку. No, raise your hand. Нет, поднимите руку. 
That's a shift in statistics. Okay. So the question here very quickly is, a minute of each of you, how, how, is, how is what we talked about here going to affect people in ways that they can relate to, or is it not, uh, Mr. Magal? Ну, в краткосрочном периоде, я думаю, с учетом того, что масштабы альтернативной энергетики у нас э, не такие большие, существенные нагрузки на потребителей в плане и, и тарифов, э, я думаю, не, до, не надо ожидать. Долгосрочный, опять же, что мы понимаем под зеленой экономикой? Это не обязательно развитие возобновляемых источников или альтернативной энергетики, это в том числе и применение технологий э, энергосберегающих, э, технологий по энергоэффективности, по, и, 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 технологии по экологичной технологии, в том числе чистый уголь, которые позволят на традиционных источниках энергии получать надежную и экологическую чистую энергию. Вместе с тем Казахстан не должен упускать возможность создания соответствующего опыта применения других источников энергии, чтобы при каких-то научно-технических революциях мы были также уже как бы в обойме и могли также агрессивно развивать другие источники энергии. So we're going to jump this way. So Matt, you next. Uh, I think that, that what I would take Я away думаю, from this is uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we don't quite know how everything is going to work out. Uh, uh, keep your options open. Diversify your sources. And then watch it. Monitor it. Make sure that you don't get into a situation where all you've done is made a stone heavier at the end of the day. Uh, that's something that you can watch as you move along. Uh, and I think it's something that's, that's quite relevant. But basically, you're making a series of bets about the longer term. You've got to sort of place your counters to begin with, but you can move them as you go along. Uh, from one category to the other, as some things pan out, some things don't. Mr. Again, on, on, the, on the, the specific question of how this is going to affect people in the next uh, 10 years, let's say, I think uh, uh, it will affect people positively. First of all, we will create new jobs. So hundreds of thousands of jobs will be created because of this green energy and green economy. Secondly, people can install capacities in their homes, so they can have wind or Продолжение следует... 
less pollution, pollution uh, technologies will introduce, uh, the, the, uh, we will at least decrease the, the speed of glaciers uh, melting. Uh, thank you. Ariel, uh, how is this going to affect regular people? Uh, well, regular people have to watch their pocketbook. You know, they say in America that uh, voters vote with their pocketbooks. Uh, so uh, if your tariffs, uh, your electricity goes uh, down, that's good. If the electricity prices go up, uh, maybe not so good. Uh, uh, if there are new jobs, as the minister said, that's terrific. If the old jobs in the traditional conventional energy uh, industry are shutting down, that's maybe not so good for people who work in traditional energy. So, as my colleague here said, it is uh, a future with Это many, будущее, many unknowns. And as the former uh, Minister of Defense of the United States used to say, there are known, known, there are known unknowns, and there are unknowns, unknowns, and we don't know what the future holds. There may be technological breakthroughs, and I hope there will be, that will speed up this process, and we will have tons and tons of cheap energy. The best thing that can happen to people is to have energy that costs nothing. I hope Kazakhstan will be in the forefront of that process. Siddharth, you get the last word. Uh, well, I can big zone answer questions and raise more uh, But, but the, the key point I like to raise are that when we say people, who do we mean? Uh, the world, unfortunately, is still a divided world with different classes, different economic strata. And, and so it will mean different things to different people in different parts of the world. There is no solution, no way of saying what does it mean to, to the people. Uh, but broadly speaking, the middle classes will pay for it. The, 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 the better chance for people from the lower strata of economic and social ladder a chance to move up to this, this Solution, to job creation, uh, to different хорошо, possibilities which didn't exist before, and of course the top elites will turn to make profits from it. However, the danger is that we should not make a template answer for anything. Uh, buzzwords like green technology should be taken into context. We should not fall into the same uh, thing like with nanotechnology. By itself, it doesn't mean anything at all, unless you give it a context and make it useful in your particular part of the world, particular society, particular industry. And uh, way of thinking. Thinking. So the bottom line is, use your strength and it will become useful for you when you can contribute to it. So actually, uh, Siddharth gets the penultimate word, I get the ultimate word. <laughs> and, 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 and all I want to do is say that, that we've been, been here for almost two hours, and, and I, 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 mean, I know this sounds funny, but I actually mean this seriously. I hope you are more confused now than you were two hours ago, because the, the answer is none of this is easy. And, and, and what I think you've heard here is five extremely intelligent people right here who know their stuff tell you that they feel very differently from one another about what the future is going to look like and about what the effects of their version of the future are going to be on you and, 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 and people around you. Um, so all I would say is keep asking questions and keep watching this space. Thank you guys very much for your time. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your time.